Hey, my name is Matt. In this video I'm going to tell you about soldering. Consider it soldering 101. I'll show you where you need to use it and the tools you need to get started. And most importantly, I'm going to tell you about soldering basics, so you can master it on your own. Let's go! Soldering is just a way of connecting parts together. To create this joint, the parts are coated with a layer of molten material called solder. As it cools down, the solder turns solid and holds the parts in place. The parts themselves don't melt in the process and stay safe and sound. Can you figure out why? That's right, the melting point of the solder is much lower than the melting point of the parts. In fact, any jointing made this way can be called soldering. For example, this is jewelry soldering, and this is high temperature soldering, and this is low temperature electronic component soldering. That's what we'll be talking about today. All modern electronic devices are assembled by soldering. On this printed circuit board, PCB, soldering was used to connect every component, not including the wire connectors, of course. This means that to put together your own devices or repair existing ones, you need to learn how to solder. To master this skill, you need few tools and materials. Most important ones are already on the table. A soldering iron with a stand and some solder. You use soldering iron to melt the solder and apply it to components. But this is still not enough for comfortable work. We also need a wire cutter to snip part leads and wires. A small one like this will do fine. And you use tweezers to bend and hold the tails in place while working. You also need a special sponge to clean the buildup from the tip of the soldering iron. And don't forget the flux. This is the bare minimum you need to get started. Choosing the right wire cutters or tweezers isn't tricky. Your tools should fit comfortably in your hand and that's it. The only thing that varies in soldering iron sponges is their size. Soldering irons vary, both in size and power. And each one does its job. For example, this soldering X can easily solder wires as thick as a finger. And with this iron, it's convenient to solder the smallest electronic parts. But if you swap them around, they become useless. So the best choice for us would be some kind of universal soldering iron. One that can both work with the small components and solder the larger wires. Here are two options that suit us. The first one is a simple soldering iron with 25 watts of power. It always maintains the temperature of around 480 degrees Celsius or roughly 900 Fahrenheit and can solder anything to anything else. However, since its tip gets very hot, it will quickly get covered with an oxide film, which means you have to clean it very often. The second one can maintain a given temperature and has a higher maximum power, 60 watts, so it proves to be more versatile. You can lower its temperature when soldering small components and work safely, knowing that the parts won't overheat. And for the thick wires, you can increase the temperature to quickly heat a large piece of copper. Either one of these soldering irons is sufficient to start with. I'll choose the one with the temperature control. It's a matter of habit. In any case, whichever soldering iron you choose, Remember, safety first. This thing heats up to very high temperatures, so make sure you don't touch it with your bare hands, otherwise you will burn yourself very quickly. And never leave it switched on unattended. Now let's look at the solder. Tin lead, 60% tin and 40% lead, is the simplest and most readily available type of solder. It looks like a wire and comes in different diameters. Thicker, thinner, for soldering electronics, you should aim for diameter of 1 mm or thinner. It melts at a temperature of about 190 Celsius or 374 Fahrenheit. Well molten solder has a glossy surface. The solder flows onto the solder iron tip very smoothly. If we lower the soldering iron's temperature, then the solder will start to set and turn into a thick gray mass, sort of like plasticine. This solder will not hold and the joints will be weak and brittle. Now let's try to solder two wires together. If we take some solder and try to attach it to a bare wire, we are unlikely to succeed at first. Let's try it again. The solder still flows away from the wire and doesn't stay in place. 
That's because of the oxide film on the surface of the copper. It prevents the solder from sticking to the wire. To destroy this film and make the solder stick, we need one more component. The flux. This substance under the right temperature actively dissolves the oxide and helps the solder stick to the now clean surface of the copper. All fluxes actually do one thing. They dissolve an oxide film. What sets them apart is their activity level. For solder and electronics, you should use neutral or low activity fluxes. They destroy the oxides only when heated. And when they cool down again, they pose no danger to the whole thing. You don't even need to wash them off. The safest fluxes for electronics are rosin based, like these ones. It's better to use a liquid or a gel flux. Now we are ready to solder a printed circuit board. A PCB is just a convenient method to put all components and wires into one place. They consist of solid non-conductive base and a thin copper list that is firmly glued to it. This circuit has been put together using wires and a breadboard. And here is the same circuit but assembled on a PCB. It's more resistant to mechanical stress. There are basically two ways to solder. Let's get to it. The first way is to feed the solder. We insert the wire into the hole of the PCB and cut the output so that it sticks out one millimeter above the surface. Now we apply the flux to the soldering points and take the iron in one hand and the solder coil in the other. Touching the soldering point with the tip of the iron, we immediately feed the solder. You see how it gradually fills the soldering point. And as soon as a small pile appears on the output, well bound to the board, we remove soldering iron. Proper soldering should not last more than 3 seconds. This way we won't overheat the connection and the wire. It may not work well at first, but the key to success is practice. This approach has its pros and cons. They are pretty obvious. We can fit any amount of the solder almost instantly, which is cool. But at the same time, both of the hands are busy. The second way needs a little more skill. But the advantage is, you can solder with one hand and use the other one to hold a PCB, for example. We do the same with the wire as the last time. Insert, cut and apply the flux. However, now we pick up the solder with the tip and touch it to the soldering point. The point is just the same quality as the last time, but we can't quickly increase the amount of solder anymore. If there wasn't enough solder right away and the joint looks like this, then you have to repeat the operation to get a neat result. When assembling electronic devices, you don't just have to solder the wires. You also have to deal with various electronic components with different numbers of LEDs. They can have two, three, and, and more. Soldering them is easy. All you need to do is to combine the soldering methods you already know. The second method makes it easy to solder parts with two LEDs. But for the rest, you can solder like this. Insert the part and fix it to the board by soldering. Next. Put the circuit board on the table and solder the remaining LEDs using the solder feed method. Let's solder a flasher circuit on a PCB. The board looks like this. It's made by hand, but it won't affect the process. The important thing when putting together a circuit board is a sequence in which the parts are soldered. Soldering the circuit board should start with the smallest components, height-wise. For example, Start with the micro circuits, then move on to resistors, capacitors and diodes. At the very end, solder a large battery holder. This approach lets you easily put together a PCB of any size and any density of parts. Now we just have to watch the flux from the board. I'll take isopropyl for that, but you can use any available solvent. And now just carefully cleaning the flux with the toothbrush. Now when it's clean, we can try to switch it on. Let's go for it. I hope this video was helpful. And now you can go on soldering without any trouble on your own. If something wasn't clear for the first time around, feel free to watch it again. Bye!